All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's robotics seminars. Uh, it's a true pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Professor Roland Sigvart. Um, if you're doing robotics, Roland will not need any introduction, has been a pioneer in the community for uh, many, many years, and his work has really shaped uh, robotics research and the field itself for the last 30 years, at least, I would say. So we'll just say a couple of words here. Um, uh, professor Sigvart is full professor of autonomous systems at ETH Zurich and is a founding co-director of the WIS uh, Zurich Institute. He was also the vice president of research and corporate relations at ETH. Uh, before joining ETH, he spent 10 years as professor at TPFL and also had visiting positions at Stanford and NASA, NASA Ames. So Professor Sigvart's research is about the design and control of robots operating in complex and very dynamic environments. And his work is really unique in the way it spans control, mechanical design, perception, mapping, and virtually touching all the sub areas of robotics. Uh, not surprisingly, he won many, many awards. I'm not going to, to mention most of them. I'm going just to touch on two of them, which I think are pretty interesting. So he got the IEEE RAS Pioneer Award for uh, um, his leadership role in the community and his pioneering role in, uh, in uh, developing research. I looked a little bit back at the research he's done over the many years, and uh, he has been a pioneer on so many fronts. Uh, he was doing, uh, I didn't know about that, he was doing, uh, um, developing robots, doing, playing table tennis, ping pong back in the 80s. Uh, he was doing uh, micro robotics, um, tactile manipulation, biospire robotics in the 90s. And of course, like, you know, we all know the work he's doing on, uh, on um, uh, quadrotors and quadrupeds, even before they were cool. So, Really impressive contributions to robotics research as well as service. Has been uh, part of the editorial boards for multiple journals. Has been uh, general chair for conferences. Um, the second award I want to touch on is uh, the INABA, uh, um, IEEE RAS INABA Technical Award, which recognizes innovation uh, and innovative research that translates into commercial products. So indeed, Roland has a remarkable history of success in developing technologies that are really working in the real world leading to him co-founding half a dozen spin-offs, um, spin-off companies. So we are truly honored, Roland, to have you today uh, at MIT. Without further ado, let's welcome him to MIT. Thanks very much for this nice introduction. Uh, typically, you speak always about what I did. In principle, it's not me which did most of this stuff at my wonderful students. So I just recently counted I'm now uh, have had more, more than 100 PhD students, and they did all this uh, great work, and it's uh, always wonderful to work with, with young people with their spray. And thanks very much for inviting me here. I had now spent already two wonderful days, a lot of inspiration. I've seen that you're working on those topics which are typically mentioned. These are the topics which are the big challenges in robotics. So I uh, see a couple of them. And we had a lot of this discussion, how much model do we need and how much learning, and and I think we, we are aligned in a lot of these points. And I think uh, it's not the end of models. We will still have to model some elements. And so today I will speak only on a small fraction of the research we're doing. And it's probably not a very deep uh, dive in, in technology and research, but it's more giving a little bit of history about our activities in flying robots. Um, we did also walking robots, then this was continued by Marco Hutte. You know that he's doing extremely well. We did other type, we did Mars exploration robots and stuff like this. But I think I was always most um, excited about the flying robots. Because flying is probably what we cannot do. We can walk, we can uh, go on grounds, uh, we can swim even, but we cannot fly. And I would like to start with um, this uh, small video, which is actually was uh, about 2004, when we were able to actually fly a quadrotor, and we later on realized that this was the first time a quadrotor was actually flying um, fully um, self-controlled um, in the air. The idea of the quadrotors was not new. Um, there were a lot of control people which did some with, which um, were on a, on a tether or on a bearing and did some experiments. But why was it all of a sudden possible? Because we had all of a sudden small IMUs. At this time, the IMU was actually still about 2,000 Swiss francs. And it was, so it's the same as in dollars. 
but it was uh, probably 10 times less good than the, the bonds we buy today for $2. Um, we had then powerful motors and uh, the controller for the motors which were needed. And this allowed to, to have this uh, flying platform, this quadrotor, which actually already had ultrasound sensors um, to do collision avoidance. This was mainly done by Samir Abu Abdallah, which um, is here now also showing that the system is doing avoidance with the ultrasound sensor. Interestingly, this uh, we just was in, were informed. I don't, I'm not allowed to, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but we will get the, the most influential paper award 2000, uh, at ITRA for this work, which is um, 18 years ago. Um, sometimes it's good if you are getting older, you get some awards because you're getting older and did some work in the past. <laughs> so this quadrotor have a, a couple of very fascinating elements. Of course, the first thing is that they are highly instable. If you don't have an IMU and a controller, you, you will fail to, immediately, which is not the case with, a, with, for example, the dual propeller coaxial rotor, which have a, some sort of a stability, natural stability. But this uh, will also bring the, this robot in a way that they can actually be extremely dynamic. And this was, uh, for example, shown by Raf de Andrea. A lot of other groups also showed this. Um, these systems, um, as you can see, can fly really extremely dynamic, dynamically. This was mainly about the controller and not about the full autonomy, because it's typically in the Vicon system and controlled by Vicon. But um, it shows really the potential of this uh, quarter or multicopter, which actually was picked up pretty fast. And today, I think we can buy them for a couple hundred dollars, um, take images on the air. And uh, they are um, really very useful. Now, some of you, or probably most of you also, that these are used also for drone racing. And actually, my son is a drone racer, and it's crazy how, fa how they fast they can fly. And, uh, but then David Escaramuzza, took the idea up, can we fly faster than humans? In principle, he showed that he can be faster as humans. But of course, he, this system, the, 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 the autonomous dro race drone, is not doing exactly the same. So it cannot go through the parkour and f find out where it has to fly. But once it has a, a, a big a sketch of the, the trajectory, it flies much faster, or as fast as humans. And you can see here an example how they fly. You can nearly barely see. But of course, humans are also about this speed. And so they were competing against the best humans. The biggest difference was actually in the start. Because there is a beep for this drone racing. Beep, beep. And the third beep, you have to go off. And actually, the, the computer is much faster in detecting the beep. And so it actually already crossed the first door before the others get off the ground. Um, that's, that's quite interesting. Now, if you have this quadrotor in general rotor wing system, you are not very efficient. And this is a drawing I've uh, taken from Fraundorfer. This is a company which is doing this um, autogear. I will come back on this, this concept. Um, but this is a roughly about a factor of 10 between a quadrotor and a fixed wing airplane. And a uh, factor of 10 means 10 times more fuel if you want to do this. I will come back a little bit what this means for aero transportation. But this motivated us to say, OK, we have now the quadrotors for small systems where you fly to take pictures. Who cares about the efficiency? Because it's, it's very lightweight. And I think it doesn't make any sense to do too much about the efficiency. But as soon as you want to do more, you need to care about efficiency. And now we said, after the quarter tour flying, what can we do next? So what is the best system to have much longer flights? And so we came up with one idea pretty early on. Um, we started about 2005, initiated by actually the Mars rovers, where the Mars rovers were then on Mars, and we were involved in European Space Station on, on Mars rovers. And of course, they could do some inspection, but they went probably 500 meters, and sometimes probably a little bit more, but you could not cover entire Mars. And then we ask out the question, could we probably fly on Mars? Now you can see, meanwhile, they have um, helicopters on Mars, which is actually also the, the initial ideas came from a former PhD student of mine. Um, 
But we had the, another idea to fly on Mars in con continuous mode. Solar airplane, which are just never getting off the ground, it directly goes in a flight mode, and then you fly just around. Now we did some estimations and calculations, and uh, we have seen on Mars the situation a little bit more difficult because the density of the atmosphere is much, much lower than, than on Earth. It's above, about comparable with 20,000 meters uh, above Earth. But it, it was uh, theoretically possible if you have uh, batteries which are probably about th three times the, the energy density of the batteries today. Um, but we have then seen that we could do this on Earth. So we were challenged to say, oh, we want to show this. And we showed this in 2008, the first time that we can fly in continuous, just using the solar cells on the, the wing, and then uh, charging the batteries for the night and fly during the night. The first one was just doing this in the best condition in summer. Then we continued, and this is in a, an airplane which uh, 2015 you flew eight, 28 hours, uh, no, not 20, 81 hours. And then we did some testing with Earth scientists which want to study these, uh, these glaciers in Greenland out, far out. It's nearly impossible to, to study this without moving there with an, uh, a manned airplane, which is very difficult because you have to bring up the whole fuel. With these airplanes, we can actually fly out hundreds of kilometers, take images, and come back. And it only needs a very small uh, spot for landing. So I think there is a lot of potential. It's, of course, somewhat fragile because you optimize the weight. You make it as easy, as light as possible. And you try to um, store then as much energy in the batteries as possible. Now, this uh, fragility makes it also that it's not so easy to handle, for example, for a farmer. And this brought us then to the next system, which is uh, this VTO system, or I'm, I'm meanwhile calling it much more hybrid system. So it's something between rotor wing and fixed wing. Um, and the most, probably the simplest way to combine this is actually a wing on the system. It's a wing, two propellers in the front, and two flaps in the back. So it's four actuators, which is enough to, to um, control the system in, in space um, so that you have x, y, z, and the rotation around the central axis. The other uh, inclinations doesn't, you don't care, like with the quad rotor. And if you do this properly, you have then, you can get off the ground vertically, have two propels, two, two flaps, and as soon as you're up in the air, you go in fixed swing mode. But the advantage is, of course, you can fly with this one much longer. You can fly probably one hour, depending on what you, for what you optimize. And you fly typically also faster, so you can cover faster a, a big environment. Um, Prototo will be much more, much, even less uh, fuel efficient or power efficient if you fly faster. Um, we did a lot of research also on how to optimize the wing shape so that it has an uh, automatic stability, which is not so easy with the wing on the system. And even the more challenging thing, but what's a very interesting control problem, what can you do uh, with strong wind? The first idea from a student came, yeah, you just align it to the wind so that the wind, if the wind is coming like this, you have to wing like this so the wind has no influence. But this is probably the worst you can do because it's very sensitive. If you have a little bit off, then... So what we did at the end is actually put it directly in the wind and you fly then some sort of like in a half stall and instead of flying like this, you fly the like this down. And interestingly, you can really, with pretty strong wind, you can still reliably land with this system. And this is now sold by, by a, st a startup for of us, Wingtra. I will come back pre uh, at the end quickly to show what, what you can do with these airplanes. Meanwhile, now, if you remember what we have seen before, fixed wing is probably about 10 times more efficient than a quad rotor. So you probably should rather start with the fixed wing system and think, how can you now make a system which can vertically take off and land? And this is actually what we are working together with Aero, uh, do for Aerospace, which is in principle also not totally new. But these systems are today, to my understanding, feasible because we have electrical motors. Now for lifting this up, you need also about 10 times the power in the motors. Now if you have a fuel engine which has to go one, uh, 10 times uh, more than in the fixed wing mode, then it will either be 
in the lifting extremely inefficient or in the forward um, fixed wing mode very highly inefficient. But if you like to commoto, you can much easier cover. And that's the reason why I think today it's a time to, to build this. And for this, we're doing a lot of work in uh, optimizing the control in the transition phase. The transition is a pretty, in principle letting strolling the, the whole airplane. But the interesting thing is you have this very strong propellers because you, they allow, also, uh, allow you also to lift. And they have a strong influence on the, the, the flow around the wing. And with this, um, you can actually identify these models and then have a very fast crossover from rotor wing to fixed wing and vice versa. Now, with this system, what can you do? We are always uh, also involved with uh, some other, very often it's other research groups doing, needing drones for some applications. For example, people in Switzerland which want to uh, uh, measure glaciers. What they want to do is to put sensors on glaciers, which will stay there for, for example, a winter or a summer, and then you should, should collect them again, so that you can see the movement and, and do some uh, additional measurement. Now, how to put them there? You can, of course, either walk out there. It's always dangerous. And so what we developed here is, is this um, tilt wing system, which can actually fly much further out than a rotor wing, so you can go far. And then you have a, a sensor system, which you can just deploy, um, and then it stands there on the glacier. Now, at one point, you have to get it back. So the tilt wing is allowed to, can really fly out far and can still then hover to precisely position, and then you can do uh, the same thing here, reverse more or less, by to collect these this sensors. Now, as mentioned before, we try always to get the best, uh, the lowest power consumption, the best efficiency for flight. Now, from nature, from uh, glider pilots, we know that they use actually the, the updrifts and, and different uh, terminals in the environment. So if you do some measurements in, in our environment, you probably should also think about using these updrifts. Now, how can you use this? On one side, you probably can, in the camera, detect areas where you assume that there is a stronger heating up. And the biggest part of the updrift is typically coming from the, the flow of the wind for the weather. So you have a topology, and you have a flow going along the, this topology. Uh, but now, how can you predict the topology? We have, on one side, good weather prediction, which gives you adrenal flow and typically also the, the amplitude of the, the wind speed. So we have the pr weather prediction. But this is in adrenal. It does not give you exactly the, the wind speed at a certain location. But this is in adrenal flow. On the other side, we have, for a lot of regions, a very good topology map of the environment. Now, if you have these two, by using CFT, you can actually calculate the wind speed around these uh, cliffs, for example, and so on. Now, CFD is extremely computational demanding. So you probably cannot, in real time, calculate this on, on board. But what you can actually do, train a neural network to predict this. And this we, we started to do. So we have CFD, where we assume this is the, the real, the, the ground truth model, which is, of course, not fully true, but we have not much more. We actually did some verification with some measurements in some regions. And then you, you learn the, the wind speed. And this is then the results where you can see, actually, it's pretty good correlation between the two wind speeds. And this is enough, actually, to really predict where you should fly, where you have good updrifts, so that you can actually reduce the, the power consumption of your, your flights. And we use then this um, in order to fly in strong winds. This is in Switzerland in air. We fly with multiple airplanes. Actually, these airplanes also share their information. So you, they have the estimation of the wind. And they get some additional information about what is the local wind where they are currently. And so we have three um, small airplanes. This is about a wingspan of uh, 1.5 meters which are flying there in pretty strong wind. You can see it shaky. You can actually see it. It's very difficult to see, but at the moment, they don't need any power, so they have no propeller. They're just gliding in this environment. You can see they're, they are doing these turns, and they are sharing actually information so that they can optimize and they can stay in this situation quite long in the air. 
probably in this context, who knows what is the fastest speed a model airplane ever was flying? What do you think? General, what is the, or probably what is the fastest? It was not 1,000, but it was close to, to um, uh, um, uh, the, the speed of sound. It was about 750, 800. Now, this is the first number. Which type of uh, engine? <laughs> Actually, yes. The, the one which is even faster, which was 850, no engine. Actually, it was flying this situations where you go all up to a, a crazy speed, no engine. Airplanes like this. So we are trying now to, to, to optimize so that we can do this autonomously. Up to now, it was done by, by a very skilled pilot. Of course, they destroy a lot of these airplanes. But it's amazing the energy which is in, in this upwind. Uh, of course, you need the right uh, situation in the, in the environment. Yeah? What's the fastest speed autonomously in this context you've been able to achieve? We are at the moment not optimizing on speed. I, I don't know. But of course, in, with, uh, with these uh, race drones, you get something like uh, 150 um, uh, top speed. I, we flew probably uh, also about 100 or something like this. We never optimized on our speed, but we want to do this with, with the, without the engine. But um, it takes some, some time. We, we are, because you need this, the wind condition also. We were pretty close to be ready in last fall. And then the, what bad weather, and now we have to wait again for the right moment for the good wind. Okay, so now we have seen all these uh, flying platforms which uh, typically try to stay away from their environment. I will come back a little bit on the, on the perception part and, and localization mapping. Um, but at one point we said, would be nice to have flying systems which actually can go and interact with the environment because there's a lot of structures where it's very difficult to reach. You have to have a crane or you have a scaffold to get there. And for doing so, you need a different type of, of uh, flying platforms because if you have underactuated platforms, you will have an issue as soon as you are getting in contact with the environment and you have to expose forces in the environment. So this was then actually the first design was from bachelor students, which uh, just took a, a multi-copter um, uh, and then connected this to, um, with motors that you can rotate it. And with this, you get an over, a fully actuated or even over-actuated uh, platform. We call this typically omnidirectional flying platform. And what, first of all, you can do, this is in principle a, a standard a quadrotor or multicopter, but by turning this, you can actually choose whatever angle you want without moving away, or you can actually be straight and move in X, Y. Now, for taking images in the air, who cares? We don't care too much. You can always compensate. But for doing force interaction with the environment, you need this because you are not, you have not enough control authority. And now. What you can do as a simple example with this, you just connect to this system a pen, and then you actually push against the, the white wall, and then you move in XY. So in one direction, you have a compliance force control, and the other direction, you have a position control. And with this, and this you can only do if you have a fully actuated system or even over actuated system. These systems with six propellers and, and all rotational. They are even over-actuated, so you have some, uh, some optimization which you can do in between, um, which uh, is also on one side nice, on the other side an additional challenge. You can see here what then the application could be. It's, of course, not writing on black uh, whiteboards, but it's, for example, going along the surface and doing measurements on bridges. We will see an example later on. Now, for doing so, you have to control these systems on trajectories where it's, uh, you want to then probably define even the orientation, the trajectory, and so on. Uh, so on one side, you have the tra trajectory planner, um, which is as an input. And 
of course, the output is the control signal for the two motor, for the motors and the rotors of the system. And as a feedback, you have a sensor system which uh, allows you to do the state estimation. Now, what we can do then, we actually calculate the wrench, more or less the force and torque, which should act on the system so that we follow the trajectory. Now, the wrench is typically one, um, uh, one vector which uh, points to the direction you want to uh, generate the force. Now, the next thing what you have to do is actually distribute so that the, this wrench signal is nicely distributed to all the propellers, which is not so obvious. And uh, there is an optimization very often in between because you're even overactuated. But so we call this the, the actuation al allocation. So this is the, the, the torque and forces you would like to act on the system. And this is then the allocation, how you can generate this by acting the, on the different motors um, and propellers and, and rotational. Interestingly or nicely, this is morphologic uh, agnostic. So only here the whole design of the system comes in. So up to here you can say you don't care if you have four propellers, five propellers, uh, if the propellers, uh, all of them can rotate as long as it's omnidirectional, you will always find an allocation, but this allocation depends on the system. This part doesn't um, depend on the system. And with this, you can then um, do six degrees of freedom trajectory following and tracking, which you can see here, which is really somewhat an eight, but where you also define the angle. And this is then the results. You can see that there's the dash line and the real line. So the reference is, uh, and the, the real trajectory is, is very nicely overlapping. So of course, as soon as you have wind, it will probably be drifting away a little bit. But in principle, you are pretty good in, in very precisely tracking um, the system. So there it's in the order of uh, probably two, three, three centimeters um, uh, precision on the trajectory and trajectory um, for flying platforms. Now, as mentioned, what we want to do with this is not doing some special new maneuvers. This might be f fun for, for artistic uh, maneuvers, but we want to interact with the environment. So then you need a little bit of a different controller. What you do then is um, you, for example, use an impedance controller. Same element we have seen before, allocation again but it's the impedance controller which actually defines then the, the wrench. And in this case of, for example, going along a surface or writing on a blackboard, you have a compliance, an impedance controller in the direction of the, the plane, and you have then a position controller or then other impedance in the other direction. So meaning that you have, you can also compensate for some of the disturbances, and you have then a compliance towards the wall, and you have a resistance um, orthogonal to the wall. And with this, you can actually write on the wall. Of course, there is a, a couple of additional issues. As soon as the wall is not fully flat, you will have different uh, resistance. We are also working on this, which makes the whole thing a little bit more challenging. But in principle, you can really go and fly along a surface which is unequal, which has different um, uh, uh, resistance, and still do uh, some measurements in this direction. So what is missing is still we have um, a lot of model errors. We have tilt rotor dynamics which are not perfect. We have airflow interaction because you can turn these propellers and so they can influence their flow. We have a joint backlash. We have model permits which are missing. By the way, in the beginning we didn't know exactly where are the biggest error. Meanwhile, we have actually realized that this is, as most often, the biggest issue, joint backlash. Because this rotation, we have uh, a gearbox, and if you have this backlash, this is really painful. So we are now doing something against this. We had first the feeling that this interaction of the airflow of the propellers are more influential, but they are not. Um, they are much less influential, but but the, uh, the other element. And the other thing we had is we just moved now to a new computer where we have everything on one computer. We have a be much better synchronization of timing. And this allows you also to be much more precise, um, which is actually even 
by we, we are less wiggling around only because we have now a central computer where we have very precise synchronization of all, all the controllers. Now, do, how can we handle this, this part? So we can actually start with the simplified dynamics, first principle dynamics, and then actually learn the residual dynamics, which we are doing also, so that we get better um, in, in position. Because my dream is still that we are so pre precise in the air that you can actually go and, and write something on the wall in millimeter precision, more or less. We are not there. Um, we have some system, I will not show it here now, but where we can actually do millimeter position, but then we have a special interaction device which uh, helps us to be so precise. And I think it's feasible, as long as you don't have a lot of um, turbulences or wind, that you can do this. And you can see here, by actually this um, um, learning of, uh, of the residual um, errors, you can already reduce the draw acceleration by 50%, and it's, uh, we're still trying to push this forward. Now, the next step is not only going and probably going along the surface, but really interacting. We want to do mobile manipulation, and one element would be opening a, a door, which is probably high up. Now, how can you do this with a, such a system? There's different ways, and we had a, before a discussion. We are actually here using two competitive ways. One is uh, MPC, and one is reinforcement learning. I'm only showing here mainly re reinforcement learning, but we didn't give up. So we know that on the, re uh, the model predictive control, we have still some, some issues where we could, should become better. At the moment, um, reinforcement learning is better, but um, we are not sure if it will stay like this. But I will focus on this end. So if you, of course, with sample-based control in general, you have, uh, on one side, you still need a model. And I think the results depend highly on the robot kinematic dynamics model, um, uh, the friction model, and so on. If you have a bad model, your results will also not so good. So we'll, anyway, we'll not get rid of models, but we probably can learn some additional elements. Elements. Now, the sample base, we have uh, all the complexities hidden in the simulation. So we, we have this complexity of a task for opening a drawer is actually not, has not to be pre-programmed or whatever. Um, we need a lot of simulations in parallel for finding the useful or the, the best trajectory. Um, and we don't know exactly how to deal with uncertainties. How much uncertainty can you build in the whole system? If we lose reinforcement learning, it looks at the moment, it, at first glance, a little bit better. We have, again, all the complexity simula uh, hidden in simulation. We can do a lot of parallel offline learning, and then um, we can randomize the environment so that we can at least cover the uncertainty in the learning process. And we did this, and we have similar videos also for for a model predictive control, but which is a little bit less good. And we um, then actually let the robot learn in simulation to open the door. So the task uh, or the reward components were door opening angle. So the angle of how the door is open. The hook door handle distance. So are you really on the hook? And body to door, um, body to door angle so that you don't collide, actually and the smoothness of the trajectory. So we don't want a really uh, extreme uh, movement. And if you do this and you do uh, some of this learning, which is, doesn't take so much uh, time and energy, um, this is the result. Which is actually was for us pretty impressive. Of course, we have to say here, you can see the the little reflectors. We assume here that um, we had not onboard vision. This is, will be the next step. Uh, this is in the Wycon system, so we have some knowledge about the environment. But we have really tested this, and it was pretty reliable. And, and you still have a, a platform which is actually moving still around. So it, it's not extremely precise in its positioning, and still is able to really open this door um, reliably. 
Now, a quick ele other element is if you want to go further, if you want to go in millimeter per, um, resolution at the end of factory, you either much, have to become much better with the flying platform, or you have a combination with this um, delta robot or something at a, a robot arm to connect to the omnidirectional platform, which we also did. So the advantage of the delta robot is that all the actuators are in the base, so there is no moving motors, and so you have a much less weight on the end effect, and which means that you have less, much less influence on the movement of the end effect compared with the, the base. And you have an order of magnitude of ten, about 10 between the dynamics of the two systems. So you really can compensate the movement of the platform, of the flying platform, which is typically in uh, not, not high, very high dynamic or high frequency um, with the, the system, which is the delta, which can go at a very high frequency. Here, only to give you a glimpse um, of how this looks like. So that you can keep the end effector at the center, even if the whole thing is moving around. You can see here the error at the, if you compensate, it's, it's getting pretty slow. So it's, it's really below a centimeter, so it's really big range moving in the millimeter range. I'm personally convinced that we can, even without the, the end effect, to move in the millimeter range. At the moment, we are more concentrating on, on the system without the, the end effect. Because in principle, with a normal actual robot, you have already the full freedom, um, and you just have to connect a, a gripper or whatever. You don't need an additional um, arm. So of course we are doing a lot of work also on, on bringing the system so that they can f uh, be fully autonomous in the environment. I have not much uh, in depth here because a lot of you already know SLAM and whatever, but of course it's, it's a very complex element and especially in flying platforms you are limited with calculation power, you are limited by, by sensors. By the way, this drove us to be among the first one doing visual um, inertial navigation because we started with flying platforms and we couldn't use lasers up there. So we did a lot of work then on, on visual inertial navigation. Uh, but then the, the tricky, one of the tricky parties for flying platform is that you still need a dense map as, as soon as you are flying close to infrastructures. And so building up the dense map with, with cameras is not so easy. Um, especially if you cannot have a stereo camera, and this is, uh, I will come back on this, is not so easy with small platforms. You will probably have a stereo depth of, of two meters, but not more. And then you have all the, the localization part, you have um, all these elements which have to work together. And you know, some of you have, have probably heard about VoxBlock, which is part of, of the whole the whole MapLab framework, which is also open source, which other people are using, is integrated on the flying platform. And what this allows us, and this is actually a couple of years old, um, is that you have, with one single camera on a flying platform, you have 3D dense reconstruction, you have um, uh, feature-based uh, mapping and localization, and you can fly in a forest, and with the goal given is only fly 100 meters in this direction. That's all. The robot has no clue, never been there, and it will build up, you can see here, based, based on the onboard camera, the 3D map, does automatically the planning um, in this environment to avoid collision. And the cameras are pretty, still pretty good in actually also seeing very fine structures. With a laser, you might also hit, uh, miss some of the elements. So, uh, you can actually really fly through forests with a lot of these leaves and, and um, get to the, the final point, which is 100 meters ahead. This is stuff which, of course, a lot of other people are also doing and which uh, is somewhat the basis for a lot of this work with the SARPA, DARPA Subterranean Challenge, which um, was also fly, uh, uh, entering in, in our code base, which we use there. Now, if you want to do something on surfaces, you have to have also a good planner, which, for example, can go, low, uh, go along the surface. For doing this, you have uh, need a state estimation, need good perception of the environment, and you need contact force um, measurements, for example. Or you just have a, a compliance or um, impedance controller, which allows you this. 
What we are working on here is the Riemannian motion planner so that you can easily follow surfaces, orthogonal to the surfaces. And this is an example of how this is done. So this is a surface which has some, uh, some special shape in all directions. And you can see here, by using this um, uh, remaining motion planner, we can actually follow the surface, always orthogonal on the surface. And this is uh, important if you want to, for example, spray paint a, a building from outside. Or if you want to go along a surface, like here in the field, what we are doing here is this is also an um, omnidirectional helicopter, but a little bit of different design. This is the design of our startup, Voliro. And here is a metal detector. And in order to measure something in the ground, you need to have a, a very short distance between the ground and the flying platform. Now, one thing, you need an omnidirectional platform because if you touch on the ground, you will probably become instable if you have a standard quadrature. And you need something like this Romanian motion plan so that you always uh, very nicely orthogonal to the surface. And you can see here, this uh, moves fully autonomously. We have here a laser on board and detects actually the mines or the fake mines which are buried in this ground, which are the yellow points by its metal detector. So there is a, an example where a lot of these elements come together where we need also a platform which is actually capable to um, withstand situations where you touch with the ground. And this is only possible if you have a fully activated system or over-activated system. Now, coming back to the depth measurement. <clears throat> With laser, lasers are still a little bit heavy. Now, we just got a, a new one which is cheap and, and light, light. There is some new ones coming out, but they're still more difficult. And then the, the cheap and light ones typically don't measure very far. Now, if you think about fixed wing, they have an advantage that they have a, 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 a large baseline if you take the wing end. But the wings are, by definition, moving up and down. So what we did here is that we have three cameras, one in the center, two at both ends. And each camera has also an IMU, so that we are really doing estimation of the movement uh, of the camera against each other. And by having a camera outside, you have a much, much better way because you have a, a large ba uh, baseline. And then all of a sudden, you can fl measure about a couple hundred meters and have good depth estimation. And this is enough for these type of airplanes if you consider the flight speed because you have to avoid once you see this. And you fly typically around 10 meters per second or a maximum 20 meters per second. Um, as mentioned, of course, up in this air, you can, a lot of sensors are not appropriate. These ones are not measuring far enough. Uh, this one uh, is heavy. The smaller ones are also not measuring 200 meters. Um, so the only way is actually to use this, this type of uh, cameras. You can do it also probably with a single camera, but with two cameras, it's even better. And this is the result. You can see here, you can see the forest, which is actually just taken from the two cameras um, from the, the wing end by also, in parallel, always estimating the movement of the, the two cameras so that you have um, an estimate of the baseline and, and the, the wing movement doesn't influence your system. So what are we doing with this uh, fixed wing systems? Um, the nice thing about they can really fly for a very long time. So as sh shown before, they can fly forever. With solar cells, we have here a system which has a little bit of solar cells, but is not meant to fly forever, but it can fly about seven hours. And with this, you can actually, from the air, then inspect um, fields. This was actually done 2019 in the Ukraine, uh, because they have a lot of fields. Meanwhile, I think everybody knows that they have a lot of um, uh, fields where they're for agriculture. And they have to cover this. And with this uh, system, we have uh, a hyper speckle camera and a, a standard camera. And what we can do is, on one side, analyze the different spectrum and then find areas where you have probably no, need more nutrition or more water. And you can also do a 3D mapping um, of the environment by just using the single camera and, and um, uh, reconstructing a 3D environment. 
And of course, the idea is to have then a measure where you should interfere, and this interference could also be with ground robots. So this is the only ground robot I'm, I'm showing, but we are working also quite a lot on ground robot. And the ground robot has then some indications from the flying platform um, where you should probably go, where there is a lot of uh, bad um, herbs or whatever, and can then mechanically interfere, what is very difficult on a flying platform. And in this case, within a European project, we actually had a system which can destroy um, this. So you don't have to push, uh, to put the pesticides out in the field. Now, another field of application, so I'm, I'm moving towards the end, so I'm showing a little bit what we can think we can best do with this flying platform is um, inspection and contact with flying platforms. If you have to do inspection here, you have to bring up people on ropes or you have to have very complicated cranes and so on. And these infrastructures, a lot of these infrastructures have been built after the Second World War. They are now 50 years plus and moving soon to its 100 years. They need inspection. They need probably also maintenance. We can probably not do the maintenance at the moment with, with robots and flying platforms, but we can do the inspection. And this is getting important. You probably heard, I think there were also bridges collapsed in the US. One big uh, accident was in Geneva, in Italy. All of a sudden, an entire bridge collapsed. And I think this is becoming very important. And we have, together with this uh, civil engineers at ETH, they have a concept that they measure the electric field <clears throat> in the concrete, um, where you have connect on one side with the, the steel reinforcement. On the other side, you have a connection to the concrete. And then you measure the field. And if you go along the surface, you can actually detect areas where the, the, the reinforcement steel has some damage. And of course, this you have to do on, on bridges outside. And we have shown that first in the lab that we can do this with a flying platform. By really pushing, we have to have a certain force to push against this. And then you have a, actually a wire to, to measure the, the field across the whole system. And then we went out in the field. Um, and it showed that the same thing you can be doing in the field. And this moment, actually, you can see here the, the Leica total station, where we are using this as for localization. Of course, the next step would be to use onboard sensing for localization. Now, quickly coming back. So since drones have evolved extremely fast in the last uh, 20 years, and I always claim that this is the fastest evolving um, robotics field in, in the last 20 years for a number of applications. We have millions of drones uh, which are used by private or professional people. Now with this, all of a sudden, there was this new dream coming up again, air mobility. Um, of course, I can in general summarize, I, I don't think this is a good idea for at least densely populated area. It's not efficient and it's still dangerous, even if you have probably multiple layers, but you have always to cross the layers if you go down. And it's not so obvious that you get more, more throughput, but it's more, pretty obvious that the efficiency is less good. But the other thing is that all of a sudden there was this drone technology, and people were fascinated about small drones, and they said, oh, now why not scaling up this uh, quadrotor or multicopter and making a bigger drone out of the faith, electric, and we fly. And I think there, a lot of people forget about the physics. There is some physics with all this. Um, there is actually a scaling with the bigger you get with an airplane, the more the structural loading is dependent, is, is critical. And aerodynamic is getting better, but structural loading is getting worse. And then, of course, quarter doors, as we have already seen before, are not very efficient. But you don't care if you take images um, from the, the air. So this is anyway such a low. But if you want to transport goods or people, you should care. Because uh, it limits your flight time and it, uh, it fuel, burns more fuel or whatever. And then, of, of course, batteries are probably not the best thing to, to use for long flights. So there is a lot of these aspects. You have seen some of them flying where I think it's not a good concept. It's known from physics that if you have multiple smaller propellers, it's less efficient than one big propeller. Also this one, one big propeller is much more efficient than a lot of small propellers. 
So it's, it's, uh, of course, there is some nice properties. If you have a multi-copter, you have some redundancy. But um, it's still, it's not uh, surprising that today helicopters have typically one propeller and not multiple. But there is some concept, if you want to do this, and I see some applications, even for human transportation, but also for, for goods transportation. But this is rather than with concept like autogyre, autogyro, uh, which is actually looks like a, a helicopter, but this main propeller is not actuated. It's turning by itself, and it's like, like the wing uh, for a fixed wing airplane, but it's a rotating wing. What this means is, if is it rotating, you can actually have lift, even if you are not moving forward. Of course, it's only rotating if you move forward, but it will turn faster than your forward movement, so you can fly much slower as this, which means that you can have a, a lift off distance, which is much smaller, even if it likes, it's like a fixed wing. Um, and also for going down, you can actually fly at very low, low speed and still have, because the rot rotor is still turning, have enough lift to, to have a, a good landing. You can see the landing, it's, it's a two, three meters or five meters, it's very short. That's a nice thing, but it's still not so efficient as fixed wing. And as mentioned, but we have already seen before, I'm strongly believe that this is the concept for a lot of stuff you should use, where you have this uh, combination of, of a, a somewhat a regular fixed wing, optimized fixed wing, which has propellers and you can turn um, around and move forward. What you should also consider with this system is that it's probably best to have really electric motors. Even if there is battery is, is not enough, you should have a f an engine which produces the energy. For land takeoff and landing, you have some battery which you can cover the peak. But as mentioned before, the electric motors allow us to really um, cover the whole range the high power you need by, for lifting and then the low power for fixed wing mode. So quickly, uh, last, uh, only example, what you can do with this, uh, with this fixed wing um, hybrid uh, system from Volero. You have a camera, very high resolution Sony camera. They can actually fly for six hours, not nonstop, they will charge the or change the battery in between, but in six hours, they cover the whole city of Zurich um, and only with this camera, you, you get a higher resolution image, which is in the order of centimeters. So you have a 3D reconstruction of a city within six hours. A city, sorry, is not huge, but still it's a certain size. And you can see the quality of this, this image is only taken by one airplane um, in, in six hours. Or you can replace these guys. This is uh, done by Volier, a startup company from our which are hanging on ropes or on, on other structures. And they can actually do measurements on, on structures. You can actually also then in the grind on structures. You can build structures. Here, this is a measurement of the lightning protection system of wind turbines. This is done today with humans hanging on ropes. It takes about six hours for one wind turbine. We can do this in 10 minutes. Or instead of cleaning or, uh, or painting uh, buildings, you can do this with the drones. This was also something we demonstrated that without a scaffold, we, we just uh, fly along the surface and, and do this. So this brings me to the end. So I still, uh, not too much too long. So I think, as mentioned, the last two decades were really pushing drone technology from research labs to the market. There have been a lot of research labs involved in pushing this technology, and it's a success story. I think uh, we should not forget the physics, and we cannot cheat the physics. I think in all this, we have to think about that there is some limitations, and we need models. We need to understand how this uh, system can fly. I see a lot of more applications which are already used, aerial imaging, agriculture, forestry, search and rescue, aerial inspection and maintenance, especially there with these interactive drones. Um, there is still a lot of uh, things to do. 3D reconstruction um, for dense environment, which uh, if you want to really fly narrow environment, this DARPA subterranean challenge, most teams had also flying platforms, including us, ready to fly. But then the final demonstration was in a very confined environment and nobody actually 
I think nobody was flying in, in there. We also didn't because it's too narrow and you have still not a very good, dense uh, 3D reconstruction. So um, you always risk that you, you, can't, uh, you collide. Physical interaction in flight, I think there is still a lot of things to do there, but it has a lot of potential. Onboard sense and avoid, as soon as you have more of these platforms out in the, competing actually for the airspace with, uh, with uh, personal and uh, private uh, airplanes, um, you have to be more sure that you don't have collisions. And of course, the, the seamless integration of this in the public airspace. There is a lot going on in Europe, I think also in the US, how to do this. Um, there is a concept that in Europe they should, especially in Switzerland, that you just go on a web page, you define where you want to fly, and this will give you clearance immediately if you are allowed to fly there um, uh, for within uh, one or two minutes. With this, thanks very much. Of course, all this work was done not by me, as it began in the beginning, with a, lot, a big team, a lot of support from different people, and it's always fun also to, to spin it out because we benefit from the spin out because we get uh, better platforms which can use, we can use in research. Thanks very much for your attention. Fantastic presentation. So I think we are going to have maybe time for a couple of questions maximum. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, so all, all the like very fully autonomous drones are all the computation are done by onboard. Is that the correct understanding? Or yes, of okay. course, not all of the videos. Right, right. Where, because we in research, you typically do some specific. But in principle, we we always our intention is always to have fully autonomous. There is also one reason. Autonomy means that you cannot depend on on a uh, wireless connection because you, most of you know that sometimes it doesn't work. And you, you, the, the drone should still be safe. Right. In a ground robot, it's probably easier because then at least you can say, OK, if you have no communication anymore, you stop. But the, the drone cannot stop in the air. It will fall down at one point. So you have to have full autonomy. Right. And then there's one video that one drone flying in the woods and just avoiding the trees. And then yeah. it's a, that's like. Fairly like static environment. Have you tested in that dynamic environment? So like, what what is preventing you from testing that? Like, what what is the challenges? Do you think? Yes, this is in principle fairly static, but in principle it's on board in real time. In principle, in principle it can uh, avoid uh, also dynamic. But um, it's probably less. We do a lot of stuff in dynamic environment with ground robots because we have people and so on. With flying platforms, the only dynamic objects are typically other, other drones, probably some birds, but it's less of a crucial issue in the beginning because uh, typically at 10 meters above ground, you don't have, have uh, really da very dangerous uh, situations for collisions. But the one thing I mentioned is this is sense of the void is avoiding other airplanes, which is becoming crucial the more we have full autonomous flight in outdoor. Right, so towards that like fully autonomous flight, um, have you worked on any multi-agent systems or like the all the slides today were like fairly like single agent, but like do you have any insights into multi-agent systems control? Yeah, so I have uh, probably some little bit biased view. First solve the single agent problems and then go to multiple agents. Right. It's much easier because then, um, of course we are doing actually some, and I didn't show this here, we do some collaborate tr transportation, which is actually interesting because they are always a limit in payload. So just recently, a week ago, our student showed his um, uh, uh, nice results on two fixed wings, which are jointly carrying something around, which is um, first in simulation, but we already did some real, real flight tests. It's probably the first time that fixed wing systems carrying together uh, something. And we had also some rotor wing or so multicopters, two and three multicopters carrying stuff around. So in this sense, yes. Um, otherwise, we are not really the specialist of in multi-agent col collaboration. We do a lot, and this was also part of the DARPA subterranean challenge. This was mainly our part in uh, is this multi uh, multi-agent mapping. So you have multi-robots to, to bring them max. But this is a very specific 
task for robotics. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, you had an experiment opening doors where you were comparing performance of MPC and RL. So if I remember correctly, the MPC was with like a, a residual dynamics where RS, RL was trained in a simulator with domain randomization. I just wanted to hear more insight on why you thought the MPC was not as performant as RL in, in that example. Yeah, in principle, we just uh, look at the result and the, the MPC failed much more often. But um, it's not the final verdict. We have still this is really uh, very um, new research uh, results. Um, so we are still positive that MPC can also do better, but we have to first um, improve the model also. I think the RL system is automatically more real, um, easier to handle a somewhat imposition of the whole um, system. With MPC, you rely still on a reasonably good model. And this we probably don't have. And I think this is the main issue why we are less good at the moment. I see. So it's model inaccuracy. Yes. Yeah. OK, thank you. I think we are, we are running out of time. We'll take just a one final question. Yes. Right. <laughs> you guys raised the end together. <laughs> You speak we'll together. Do all, right. We'll do both. all right, all right. You've been working on flying robots for over 20 years. What's the hardest problem you worked on in flying aerial robotics? It's probably a weird answer I'm giving you, but actually the, the hardest problem for research is that these systems are, if something goes wrong, they are crashing and they're broken. We are, I'm always so happy, happily seeing that the others don't have it. Walking robot, if they crash, they fall, but they will not. Our system always break. By the way, this is something we are working on, and hopefully in a year from now, I can show you a system which is nearly never breaking. And the breaking means that the first important thing is IMU. IMU are pretty good, and you can probably have in worst case too. But what we always have a problem with, the next step is the visual motion estimation. So that the, otherwise the, the system will also always fly away. So you, IMU is, is still drifting. This motion estimation, we, we are doing since a long time. And I think our system is pretty among the problem with most reliable, but they still have an issue. All of a sudden, there is something wrong. And then it goes. So we are replacing this with another system. I don't tell you where, with what. And hopefully, we can hopefully in a year from now, say our system, if you have all the perception is it's broken, it will still be stable in the air. And then you can actually take it over in a, calmly and, and bring it back on ground. But this is probably the biggest challenge <laughs> that it's, I think those who are using drones, it's, you crash with so many drones, it's, uh, it's, it's a pain. Uh, I guess I, I have a question regarding the reinforced learning controller uh, that you're training simulation. Uh, how how much do you rely on model knowledge there? Like, do you still assume or do you still yeah assume that you have the model knowledge of the quadrotor uh, yeah. of the the robot there, or do you, uh, so yes. you still assume that? But like in MPC case, you also have that knowledge. So what really makes a difference is actually the uh, say uncertainty of the environment or the dynamics of yes. the drawer, for example. That's the case. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, folks. So we'll have to close here, but we are going to have the usual social event here. So Professor Sigbert is going to be here until maybe like you know 4:30. If you have more questions, just come and ask. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Roland. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.